Hi everyone, welcome to the third part of our respiratory unit. This is acute respiratory distress and mechanical ventilation. Okay, so just as a little bit of review, uh, I wanted to put this picture up here of the normal gas exchange unit. A uh, reminder that oxygen comes in, uh, we breathe it in, and uh, carbon dioxide is then offloaded. Uh, what you see here is the alveolus, so a single alveoli. And you can see that there's a deoxygenated blood comes in, and then it is oxygenated and returned to the heart for circulation. So this is the basis of gas exchange in the lungs. And very important to what we're about to talk about. So when stuff starts to go wrong with the lungs, one of the things that can happen is called a respiratory failure, acute respiratory failure. Respiratory failure can be divided into two specific types. The first one is hypoxemic respiratory failure, also known as type one respiratory failure. And this failure, we have low oxygen in the blood. Now, this can be due to cardiac or respiratory causes, for example, cardiogenic shock, ARDS, pneumonia, smoke inhalation, even hemorrhage. Basically, there is not enough oxygen into the blood. The other type of respiratory failure is called hypercapnic respiratory failure, or type 2. And this is a failure of the movement of the air in and out of the lungs. So this is ventilatory failure. Now, the signs and symptoms between those uh, two sometimes overlap and sometimes don't. So let's look at the actual signs and symptoms. For hypoxemic respiratory failure, the person is generally short, uh, short of breath with an increased respiratory rate, increased work of breathing. Their O2 sats are low, which can cause altered mental status. And hypercapnic respiratory failure, uh, the person is also short of breath. You'll see them tripod, purslip breathing, and with decreased deep tendon reflexes. They can also have an altered mental status. Uh, that's usually because sometimes uh, somebody starts with hypercapnic respiratory failure and ends up with hypoxemic or vice versa. And uh, therefore, we do have a lot of overlap, but those are some of the specifics. And then there is a third type of respiratory failure, which is mixed respiratory failure. So as you can tell, that would be both. So a failure of oxygenation and ventilation. So the treatment of all of these uh, respiratory failures does land on some specific things. First of all, oxygenation. We need to apply oxygen to people who are in respiratory failure to make sure that they have oxygen available to be offloaded into the system. We mobilize secretions to make sure that they have effective airway clearance and get anything out of the uh, alveoli so that we can you know, expectorate and make sure that gas exchange can occur at that lower level. We use medications like bronchodilators, steroids, diuretics. We maintain their mean arterial pressure greater than 65, which is uh, more of a concept under shock, but uh, mean arterial pressure basically that's a measure that we can get off of our blood pressure that shows that we have good perfusion to our end organs. And then uh, another thing we need to do is make sure that the person has good nutrition. Uh, these folks are in a hypermetabolic state. It's hard work to breathe hard and fast, and these people need nutrition. So ideally, they need to be uh, eating within 24 to 48 hours of presentation. Okay, so respiratory failure, we spoke about acute respiratory failure. Um, you can have chronic respiratory failure underlying, even hypoxemic and hypercapnic. And what happens with these folks is a lot of times they have 
uh, exacerbations. So an exacerbation of hypercapnic respiratory failure would be, uh, a common one would be a COPD exacerbation. So the difference is how long the signs and symptoms are lasting. And you can see that for acute, it's within minutes to hours, and chronic is longer than that. So the next concept I want to discuss with you is something called a VQ ratio. So VQ is basically, it's ventilation, uh, is the V, which is the air in and out, and Q is the perfusion, so that's the blood going round and round. So for this, uh, we definitely have normal VQ ratio of 0 0.8 to 1.2. Um, and basically, we want that to be in that range. Like if we had a one-to-one -one ratio, that would mean that ventilation and perfusion were pretty evenly matched. So healthy VQ is one. And then uh, we do accept a little bit of a range outside of that, so 0.8 to 1.2, but not a very big spread. Uh, what happens with shunting is that we have an area where there's perfusion but no ventilation. So remember, ventilation is the air in and out. So the blood is there, but it cannot pick up any oxygen. And at that point, the, the level there is zero. So um, things that would cause that would be like pneumonia, you can see them listed here, atelectasis, uh, a tumor, something blocking. Then the third one is a dead space. So this is where we have the air moving in and out, but there's no blood to collect it. So this means that uh, we're unable to even calculate the VQ ratio. So that's a high ventilation and no perfusion, so there's uh, it's to infinity. So this would be uh, pulmonary embolism, cardiogenic shock, so we're not perfusing into the lungs. Those are the main causes. And then the fourth, if you see down in the right-hand corner there, that's a silent unit. That means that there's no ventilation and there's no perfu perfusion, so a pneumothorax where the um, Blood supply is clamped down, and also the lung is collapsed. Uh, severe ARDS. It is a terrible thing to have a silent unit. None of these are actually good. Uh, let's, let's take a look at a graphic of it. Uh, so here you have uh, just exactly what we talked about, ventilation, perfusion. So if you want to uh, pause here, you can see some of the different causes. And you could see the air normally moving out. The center would be a normal unit. And then on the right, we have perfusion. Well, on the right side of the slide, so it would be on your left as you're watching this, a perfusion without ventilation, and on the right would be ventilation without perfusion. So we're going to explore the topic of pulmonary shunting just a little bit here. Basically, the lungs are smart, okay? Not as smart as the kidneys, but absolutely smart. They detect hypoxia, and then they vasoconstrict the lungs. So this is why um, any oxygen given to folks when they're shunting will not reach those areas. Imagine, if you will, um, you're congested on the throughway, so... Uh, basically, you, you need gas, there's no gas station, uh, traffic is backed up, you get off the throughway. So that's, that's basically what's happening here, that the um, deoxygenated blood is going from the right to the left heart without gas exchange. And there's that hypoxia reflex. So it's different than peripherally. Peripherally, if we have hypoxia, it causes our vessels to dilate but in the lungs, it causes them to constrict. And this is a life-saving thing sometimes, right? It's the, the lungs basically working to get the best oxygenation. So if there's an area that's not working, it shuts it down. So remember, the oxygen never reaches the blood. So this is why we give oxygen for respiratory failure because generally there's some measure of relative shunting uh, with our oxygen and this would be absolute shunting. <laughs>
So we need to give oxygen regardless. Oxygen is palliation here. We need to work on reversing the cause of the respiratory failure. And I wanted to take a moment and uh, really let you know something about the ABGs, which is our PaO2, which we talked about normal, is 80 to 100. Once it gets to 60 to 79, so we're just a hypoxemic in the arterial blood gas, it usually doesn't strain the cardiovascular system. However, we put oxygen to make sure it doesn't. Moderate hypoxemia is 45 to 59. And this, we will end up with massive hypoxia if the system is not able to compensate, so we give oxygen there. And if our PaO2 is under 45, that is severe hypoxemia and associated with tissue hypoxia and needs immediate correction. So you can see the common denominator here is once we get under 80, we really want to apply oxygen to prevent bad stuff happening to our patients. And this was an interesting question, but it says, when caring for a client with hypoxemia and right-sided pneumonia, the nurse knows to place the client in which of the following positions to improve oxygen saturation. So you have left side down, right side down, semi-fowlers, or high-fowlers. And in this case, uh, if they have a right-sided pneumonia, then you want to put them left side down. So we increase the blood flow by laying on the unaffected side. So good lung down. So that's the, uh, that's the answer to that. So now let's start talking about some of the indications for mechanical ventilation. So you can see here that uh, it's pretty black and white at NCLEX Hospital, right? We, we have definite times when we would intubate and definite times we wouldn't. However, what you see out in the actual world will not always mirror this. There are many reasons why a person who normally would be on a ventilator isn't, including advanced directives and also their, their state, right? So we want to be able to have people who go on the ventilator who have a chance to come off. So those are discussions that the doctors have, and we will often delay mechanical ventilation as long as possible if some of our other treatments are working. But uh, you could see here in red, so the PaO2 is under 55, and we are giving them at least 60% oxygen. So the FiO2 is 0.6, or 60% oxygen. So that means that despite us giving them that oxygen, they cannot hold their blood gas or um, their CO2 is over 50 with a pH less than 7.32. And that's for usually acute deviations. If somebody has uh, chronic deviations, we do allow a bit more wiggle room in there. Uh, the respiratory rate, if it's over 35. So this means that the person's working very hard to breathe. And then uh, result of any other pulmonary function uh, test. So what we see uh, clinically in a patient uh, you might see them not breathing or breathing uh, slowly. So that is an absolute indication for mechanical ventilation if they are not breathing at all. Uh, respiratory, respiratory distress with confusion. In fact, when the oxygen falls under 55 acutely, the short-term memory is altered and the patient actually can experience like a euphoria and impaired judgment. Uh, people who are in shock states, so global hypoperfusion, and again, if they're just working super hard to breathe and nothing else is working, then uh, this might be it. So I don't think I want to say any more on that. Actually, I do want to say something. Uh, there is something to be said about uh, decreased oxygenation as well. And one of the things I always learned was that the brain softens before the lung hardens. So this is just a reminder that sometimes some of the earliest manifestations that we see in a patient revolve around their increased respiratory rate trying to compensate and then that altered mental status sort of agitation. And the other thing I want to mention here is the role of oxygen toxicity. So we'll talk about that later as well. 
but we always need to be concerned uh, about oxygen toxicity. So we want to use the least amount of oxygen for the least amount of time possible. Again, that's the key, what's possible and what's not. All right, so let's talk about some of the common ventilator settings. So this is from your textbook. Uh, some of the things that you'll normally see, uh, you'll see the respiratory rate, tidal volume, FiO2, and then the positive end expiratory pressure. So these are just settings. Uh, there, there's tons more that the respiratory therapist will set. And reminder, when we talk about mechanical ventilation, is that the respiratory therapist is your best friend when it comes to people on the ventilator. The respiratory therapist has a degree, much like you're seeking right now. It's a, they have a two-year degree, and it's all in respiratory and lung function and vents, and they can be an, an amazing resource. So the uh, normal respiratory rate is set between 12 and 20 for adults. You should recognize that as a normal value. The tidal volume is based on the patient's weight, and usually 6 to 8 milliliters per kilogram, and for ARDS, a little bit less. And the tidal volume is how much air is given uh, during each ventilator breath. And then the FiO2 is the percentage oxygen. So room air is around 21%, and it can go all the way up to 100. And you can see we usually adjust it off the ABGs to keep the O2 level 60 to 80, which is sort of what I talked about before, that we don't see a lot of cardiovascular compromise until we get under 60. And then the positive end expiratory pressure. That is a little extra oomph that holds the lungs open at the end of expiration. So basically it keeps the alveoli from collapsing. Usually we only need five, but with ARDS we usually need a lot more PEEP. So CMV is also called assist control or AC. So basically this is the ventilator doing the work of breathing for the patient. So assist control, CMV, you'll see them uh, written, they're exactly the same uh, mode. So this mode is used for patients who require the most support from the ventilator. Uh, their tidal volume is usually set, like we said, four to eight, 10 mLs per kilogram in that range, uh, sometimes require decrease due to lung compliance. Uh, assist control can be used in patients who are spontaneously breathing or not. But there's a couple of downsides here. So uh, people who are on CMV or assist control are more likely to fight the vent. So if the patient's body is calling for more tidal volumes or they're not breathing in sync with the machine, then the person can absolutely fight the vent. They'll have high peaked pressures. You'll see their vital signs will be skewed. And um, this can lead to poor outcomes for the patient, which is why often when we see fighting the vent, we look at the need for uh, sedation and analgesia, the most important being sedation. And then the other thing is, because this uh, is basically oftentimes doing a lot of work for the patient, prolonged use ends up decreasing the use of the respiratory muscle. So it's actually harder to get the patients off the vents when they are uh, on CMV or assist control. So the uh, other common mode uh, is synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. So basically, uh, the machine is a bit smarter here, right? Basically, it's allowing the patient to draw the breath, and if the patient does not draw the breath, then it will provide it for them. So this is called the weaning mode, usually. It causes the patient's respiratory muscles to work more, uh, more so allows them to sort of exercise their lungs. But for weaker or critically ill patients, this can actually cause them to tire out easier because, again, it's causing them to work more. But this would be your, uh, this would be your weaning mode. 
And now a little bit more about PEEP. You'll hear about PEEP a lot when we talk about respirations and respiratory stuff. So PEEP prevents the alveoli from collapsing. And we usually are set around five, and we need more than five uh, when we have decreased lung compliance. So things like uh, ARDS, severe pneumonias, those can cause decreased lung compliance. There are some complications with PEEP. The more sort of pressure we leave at the lungs at the end, uh, it can actually cause compression of some of the thoracic vessels, which decreases venous return. So if that's the case, uh, anything that increases pressure in the thoracic cavity can lead to a, a decreased return to the right side of the heart. And then uh, barotrauma, pneumothorax, is always a concern. So we can cause uh, the alveoli to rupture. And if that's the case, then what we see would be basically the same signs and symptoms of a pneumothorax that we've already learned. And if that's the case, the person may need a chest tube. In general, we want to avoid high PEEP, but sometimes it's necessary. I know there's a couple other um, types of ventilation that we don't really talk about too much in this course, but just to let you know they exist for when we have to worry about more of these um, more of these issues with PEEP. We have airway pressure release ventilation in which the expiratory phase is longer than the inspiratory phase, uh, but the problem with that is it does cause more pneumothorax and other barotrauma. And then we have the high frequency oscillatory ventilation that keeps the PEEP almost constant, but also increases the risk of pneumothorax and barotrauma. So that's the ventilator setting. I don't know if you've ever seen that. They put it on pre preemies on it quite often. It's uh, almost like it's shaking them. Now that we've discussed that, let's go down to the actual intubation of a patient. So uh, we do, most places now we use video laryngoscopy. Uh, Glidoscope allows us to see and uh, record while we're doing it, so you can go back and, and take a look. But uh, you see there, uh, basically, this is a laryngoscope. That's one folded up, and that's uh, all the different handles and size blades that one can use. So you'll see uh, the doctor's asking for the blades. Uh, the curved ones are... Uh, Mac blades and the straight ones are called Miller. Not that you need to know that, but uh, the Mac blades, I always remember them being curved because they're like an apple, like a Macintosh apple. So that's how I remember them. So I look real smart in the room if the docs has hand me a Mac and I know what it is. Uh, so intubation. So that's the tools that we use. Uh, and then let's talk about some of the medications. The medications here are uh, very, very dangerous medications. So you want to know exactly what you're doing with these meds. In fact, there was uh, just recently a case with a nurse who uh, gave a neuromus uh, neuromuscular blocking agent uh, and basically uh, killed a patient. Her name was uh, Redonda Vaught. So the medications, we may use some pre-medication, so atropine and lidocaine. Lidocaine is not normally given. Uh, you might see it in case of increased uh, intracranial pressure, so Anytime we're, we're doing any of these maneuvers, we can cause increased pressure. So if we have somebody with a head injury or something like that, then they'll often give lidocaine. So it's not normally given. And then we have the induction meds. So these are sedatives and anesthetics, including atomidate, fentanyl, ketamine, midazolam, and propofol. So that's how those are all pronounced. And then the paralytics, so the NMBAs, neuromuscular blocking agents. So some of those are succinylcholine, pancuronium, and rocuronium. So things we uh, you should know about them is succinylcholine is fast, but you can't reverse it. You have to wait for it to wear off. And rocuronium takes a little bit longer uh, to work, 
but uh, it does have a reversal agent, which is the neostigmine. So anytime we're starting to consider giving any of these meds, especially those neuromuscular blocking agents, your concern has to be for the ventilation of the patient because once one of these drugs takes effect, they are not going to be able to move a muscle. All right, those uh, NIMBAs or neuromuscular blocking agents basically will make it so they cannot even blink an eye or move a diaphragm. So you must be prepared to ventilate the patient. We use them uh, sometimes even when the patient's already ventilated. So if somebody is really, really sick and uh, or they're, you know, they're fighting the vent so much. This is why uh, we sometimes will give these. But remember, if we're not using it, we're losing it. So increased use of these neuromuscular blocking agents can actually work against the patient. So the more sedatives and blocking agents they have on board, the less likely they are to be doing their own work of breathing. So it can make it very difficult to wean these patients. So bear that in mind. One of the main ways we intubate somebody is called rapid sequence intubation. This is fast. It's very effective uh, for emergency airways. And the reason we do rapid sequence intubation is because most people who have an airway emergency don't plan it, right? They don't plan to say, you know, at 2 o'clock today, I'm going to go into respiratory distress and need to be put on a mechanical ventilator. Uh, so I'm going to make sure I'm NPO for, you know, at least eight hours before. Uh, so a lot of these are emergency situations. So we need to gain immediate control over the airway while making sure we negate the impact of people who have uh, full stomachs or if they have an intact gag reflex. So rapid sequence intubation. Uh, so people, people who are already like in a CPR situation, we don't do rapid sequence for them. They don't need any medications generally because they're they're unconscious and they're uh, basically uh, don't we don't need to do that. We're trying to save their life. So this is for people who uh, generally were having an emergency situation and still have intact reflexes. So um, we do an induction agent first to induce unresponsiveness, and then we do the neuromuscular blocking agent, and that, again, makes them stop breathing altogether. So it can be very risky if you have a doc who doesn't know what they're doing or a team who is not communicating well. So always remember to make sure that you are bagging this patient with a BVM. All right, and here is the actual side view of endotracheal intubation. If you're not sure what size to grab for the tubes, we say it's the rule of pinky, uh, so rule of finger. So take the patient's pinky, and that's usually the size that you need. It is a, this can be pretty dangerous um, to make sure you have it uh, in the right area and not too far down. If you can see here, you could almost put that right down the right bronchus and or in the esophagus, if you uh, go through the epiglottis. And the next thing is, uh, how do we check placement once it's there? So let's say doc uh, basically intubates the patient. So we usually, uh, what we'll do is uh, inflate the tube, check to make sure the lungs are expanding. Uh, equally, check the breath sounds, listen over the stomach, and I do mine a little different. I always listen over the stomach first because if that first breath is in the stomach, I want to hear it, not after, you know, the third breath that goes down there. Uh, we have an end tidal CO2 detector, so these are chlorometric uh, detectors, so... If it's working, it should turn yellow like Big Bird. We don't like Barney, we like Big Bird, so we don't want purple, we want yellow. And then we secure the tube 
at this point, uh, there's potential we could have put a lot of air in the stomach, uh, talk to the doc, see if a nasogastric tube is indicated, plus we'll need some form of uh, so decompression initially, but then to make sure we're feeding the patient. And then we did uh, get the chest x-ray to confirm the tube placement. You always want to mark where the tube is at the lip line. All right. So you always want to know where it's at. So if it's at 22 at the lip line, you want to document that, and that's where it should stay. Uh, we want to make sure we're checking those cuff pressures for our uh, mechanically ventilated, critically ill patients every six to eight hours, and we talked about the reasons for that previously. Sometimes people need a bite block to keep them from chewing on the tube. Obviously, we need good oral hygiene and suction of the oral pharynx as needed, so uh, if any secretions are kind of lodging in there from that, uh, repositioning to prevent uh, pneumonia, to prevent atelectasis. And then, of course, warming and humidifying of any oxygen that's given. So our ventilators nowadays, they take care of that. They warm and ventilate the air. So some of the, the problems with uh, mechanical ventilation in general, one of them is value trauma, which is the tidal volume is too high and over distend the alveoli. The other is barotrauma, which is um, basically elevates the lung pressures, uh, sometimes too much PEEP. So if we see signs of barotrauma, that will be um, low oxygen levels, tachypnea, agitation, high peak pressures. So depending on how much barotrauma the person has. Um, subcutaneous emphysema is also a sign of uh, barotrauma. So what are some of the complications? Sorry about that. Uh, complications of intubation. Uh, basically, the tube itself being in the uh, trachea. We have the patient unable to speak. We can cause laryngeal stimulation and increase intracranial pressure. And of course, the patient could accidentally remove it. So people who are acutely ill and on mechanical ventilators, you'll often see them with wrist restraints on. And uh, if that's the case, we don't usually count them as restraints uh, for that reason. Uh, they are not re they are restraints in the strictest sense, but they're not considered restraints per standards because they're to keep the patient alive and not actually trying to restrict their voluntary uh, motions. Okay, so let's take a moment to talk about the ventilator alarms. Uh, these are, there's a lot of different alarms that will go off, uh, some for low pressure, some for high, some for um, minute volume, some for tidal volume. Uh, but the, the main ones we'll talk about are the um, low and the high. So the one thing I always want to bring you back to here is no matter what's going on, if the ventilator fails for any reason, if you cannot figure out the source of an alarm and you cannot ensure that the patient is being adequately oxygenated and ventilated, then you have the power to take control of the patient's airway and bag them yourself while you get some assistance. It's never okay to just turn off an alarm and silence an alarm without looking for the cause. All right, so low pressure. The low really means there's a leak somewhere. There's a disconnect or an air leak in the circuit. So this alarm occurs when the ventilator does not have enough resistance that it's pushing against. So if you see a low pressure alarm or hear it, uh, things that it could be are um, any of the connections. Most common is that it's literally connected right from the patient. So check there first and you know make sure it's on. And then uh, if it's on, then you have to chase, uh, trace the circuit looking for any disconnection. Sometimes there's like little caps on things or people are getting um, like breathing treatments through the vent. They have a little cap cover on that. That could have blown off. So uh, just check there. And if you cannot figure out the cause, uh, you can bag the patient, get the respiratory therapist involved. 
Now, high pressures on the other alarm uh, are the other alarm to worry about. If these are the uh, basically when the machine, the ventilator, is sensing too much pressure that it's pushing against. So, uh, high pressure alarms is usually I think of like a plug, right? Increased airway pressure. This could be that the patient's coughing. They may have a mucus plug. Uh, they may have pulmonary edema, could be a pneumothorax. The patient could be fighting the ventilator. And if that's the case, we want sedation for the patient. You'd want to call and get some. Uh, atelectasis, bronchospasm. So what do we do, right? Um, first and foremost, uh, the person just may need to be suctioned. They could have kink tubing. If they're biting, you can use an oral airway. They have a pneumothorax, you need to prepare for a chest tube. Uh, check the ABGs if needed. So basically most common are gonna be secretion, suction, and biting and fighting. Remember, if something bad is happening and you cannot figure it out, you can take the airway and bag them yourself. All right, so let's talk about suctioning. <laughs> a little different than open suctioning, like a trach. This would be inline suctioning. Uh, these are great, honestly. Uh, these sometimes you'll see them attached to a T piece to a trach, but definitely with our mechanically ventilated patients because it allows us to suction the patient without taking them off the vent, um, and that allows the peep to continue. And that is very important because if we were to disconnect the ventilator, any peep that was being given by the ventilator immediately ceases. It's better infection control and also protects us. But the treatment of uh, suctioning is pretty much the same. Uh, so you definitely want to oxygenate them prior uh, you can turn up the ventilator to 100%. And the same thing applies. If you see a dysrhythmia or anything happening, then you need to stop what you're doing and hyperoxygenate the patient. Now, basic care of somebody with an endotracheal tube is to check that position at least every four hours, assessing their skin integrity, stability of that securement device, auscultate their lung sounds, and then do their oral care very, very frequently. The reason we want to do this is because people who are on a ventilator are at high risk for ventilator-associated pneumonia. So we know it's ventilator-associated pneumonia if it occurs 48 hours after they're intubated. Uh, so people who get pneumonia from the ventilator, they end up with longer hospital stays, worsen, worsening outcomes. They are often subjected to many different uh, antibiotic resistant organisms. And just like we have bundles to prevent against catheter associated UTIs, we also have them to guard against ventilator associated pneumonia. So some of the things we need to do, elevate the head of the bed give them sedation vacations, and try and get them weaned off the ventilator. Chlorhexidine for their oral care. We need to reposition our patients. And then other common care uh, that would be needed would be stress ulcer prophylaxis and DVT prophylaxis. So uh, we do not want these folks who are mechanically ventilated to get a stress ulcer. So they're usually on a proton pump inhibitor and they should be on anticoagulation as well. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about acute respiratory distress syndrome. So with ARDS, basically we lose the ability uh, for our alveoli to basically participate in gas exchange. Uh, the capillary membrane becomes damaged and um, more permeable, which allows fluid to leak into the uh, alveoli, basically makes it like a cotton ball that you dip in water. So 10% of all ICU admissions uh, were for ARDS, and this was pre-COVID. I'm sure the numbers uh, changed with COVID. 
50% mortality rate. Now, sepsis is uh, the most common cause of acute respiratory distress syndrome, but there are multiple different causes to it. So remember, it's, it's not necessarily um, a lung issue at its start. That's where we see it. But it generally, it's usually from a systemic disorder. But let's talk about it a little bit more. Basically, it does result in a lung injury, and it could be direct or indirect. So some of the uh, indirect sources would mean that the source really isn't the lungs. This could be sepsis, uh, transfusions like trally, people who experience burns, pancreatitis, drug overdoses. Or it could be a direct result of the lung injury, and that would be pneumonia, aspiration, inhalation, drowning, embolisms. But in general, whatever has happened usually isn't in an island. So what I mean to say by that is the patient is ill, all right? They have some measure of inflammation in their body. And the more inflammation, the more likely it is that the, the lungs will be damaged. So even if that has nothing to do with the lungs, it could end up in the lungs. And sometimes it does start in the lungs. So there's uh, different phases of ARDS. We're going to get to those next. All right, so there are three main phases of ARDS. You have the exudative phase, proliferative, and then the fibrotic phase. So uh, you can pause here to sort of read that, but we're going to go into each one of the phases on the next couple of slides here. So the injury or exudative phase uh, basically starts within 24 hours to 72 hours after the initial lung injury so or whatever is happening to cause the problem. Basically, we have a cytokine storm, so that's leaking. And what do we leak? We're leaking fluids and proteins and other substances. And proteins draw water into themselves. So as a result of this, uh, fluid starts to build in the interstitium. So early in this phase, the person doesn't have altered lung sounds or adventitious lung sounds because it's in the interstitium. So the alveoli are still functioning, but there's fluid in the interstitium. But eventually it does cross the alveoli membrane and enter the alveolar space, and that leads to the capillary blood not being oxygenated, which gives us a mismatch and then starts a shunt which then stimulates more inflammatory and immune systems. So as a result of that, uh, we end up with uh, compensation initially, but then the patient no longer compensates, and uh, the person ends up with decreased oxygenation, um, decreased cardiac output, decreased perfusion, so they can go into shock, which uh, can lead to multiple organ failure, or multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, and eventually death. So, but it starts with this phase. And in this phase, the cells that produce surfactant are starting to get damaged. So surfactant basically allows for the smooth movement of the alveoli. And then there's something called the hyalur membrane. So basically, a uh, hyaline membrane forms. It starts to form in the injury phase. And then it really, really takes off in the, uh, in the next phase. So how do we start to see some of these uh, signs and symptoms? So the injury phase. So there's surfactant dysfunction. Um, the hyaline membrane makes everything stiff. We have the shunting. And here's the kicker. The patient is not getting better despite giving them oxygen. 
So what will we see? Initially, we'd see respiratory alkalosis as the respiratory rate increases and causes loss of CO2. In fact, the increased respiratory rate is one of the first signs of ARDS. But then as the membrane continues to grow, it blocks the CO2 release, and then you'll start to see the person retaining CO2. So after that first phase, we go into the second. So if that problem continues for one to two weeks after, uh, then this reparative or proliferative phase continues on. Lung compliance continues to decline. Um, we have ever-increasing inflammation and can have pulmonary hypertension. And the goal here is to not progress to the fibrotic phase. So if we stop this phase, the patient can generally get better. If we don't, if this phase persists, then they end up in the fibrotic phase. And there's the fibrotic phase. This is the chronic or late phase. It's two to three weeks after. Um, if the person doesn't recover, they, their tissue becomes really fibrotic. They'll have pulmonary fibrosis. So if patients are going to recover, it's within six months that they would have the pretty normal lung function. But generally, it's not possible. Generally, people do not recover from this. So oops, let me just move this guy over here. So let's recap ARDS. So uh, basically, our O2 is less than 60, a PCO2 greater than 50, and a pH less than 7.35. Uh, we have a cytokine issue with tumor necrosis factor, interleukin 1 and 6, which leads to leakage and pulmonary edema, and then decreased surfactant production, alveolar collapse. So the hallmark here is increased capillary permeability with hypoxemia unresponsive to oxygenation. So chest x-ray would show bilateral infiltrates or a whiteout. And this has to occur within 72 hours after whatever lung injury occurs. Well, if it's a burn, it happens within 72 hours. If it's um, sepsis, it's you know, within that time frame. And here's your clinical assessment. So the initial presentation, remember, uh, the increased respiratory rate is often the first sign that you'll see. Very easy to miss that. Uh, but as it progresses, the person could be uh, short of breath, tachycardic, cough, they could be restless. You may hear the fine scred, uh, scattered crackles. But again, in the earliest phases, you probably won't hear much at all because the fluid's in the interstitium. It's not until it starts to go into the alveoli that you start to have adventitious lung sounds. Uh, if you checked an ABG, you'd probably find them in respiratory alkalosis with a little bit of mild hypoxemia. And the chest x-ray early on doesn't show too much, right? But then as it progresses, we end up with coarse crackles, uh, diffuse extensive whiteouts. And at this point, the patient is very sick. So let's take a look at what a chest x-ray looks like. You can see a normal chest x-ray on the left and then ARDS on the right. So the other thing to consider is that uh, basically when we have ARDS, there's the pulmonary edema, and that's what you see here. If you, if you look, you can see all of this white out here. We have to make sure that it's non cardiac in origin. So to do that, we often check this uh, brain naturetic peptide or BNP level. And then also an echocardiogram can also distinguish to make sure that it is the lungs that are the problem and not the heart. Okay, so the next thing to consider with ARDS is the PF ratio. So basically, it's a quick calculation that allows us to see what's going on with the patient, whether they're okay or heading towards ARDS. So we look at the oxygen, 
to percentage oxygen ratio. So check the ABG, get the PaO2, and then the FiO2 is whatever oxygen we're giving them. And you can see uh, the math that's related to this. So in this particular example, the oxygenation is at uh, 83. So the PaO2 is 83 and at 45% FiO2. So make that into a decimal, so 0.45. And then divide the PaO2 by the FiO2, which is 184. So what does that mean, though? So that comes down to uh, the Berlin definition of ARDS. So for this at uh, basically 184, it falls into that moderate ARDS level. So this is the Berlin definition. And it means that basically the onset of our illness was within the week, uh, that the chest x-ray shows the whiteouts, uh, the PF ratio is under 300 with at least five centimeters of PEEP. And again, that we are holding the heart blameless for this. We cannot explain what's happening as being congestive heart failure or fluid overload. So that's the Berlin definition. So what's, let's talk about ARDS management. There's the three P's that you have to remember, which is prone PEEP and permissive hypercapnia. So prone is basically, uh, most of us know what this is now because of, because of COVID actually, when we would see all the patients on ventilators laying on their belly. So prone is to put a person laying on their stomach. And uh, this basically helps with the uh, positioning, the better oxygenation of the lungs. Uh, PEEP as well, because the, we provide PEEP to keep those alveoli open which allows us to improve oxygenation. And then pi permissive hypercapnia, which is a lower tidal volume. Remember, it's never OK if somebody has a TBI or increased intracranial pressure to allow per, uh, permissive hypercapnia. And then a uh, couple things about PEEP. Again, PEEP can cause hypotension because of the decreased flow to the right side of the heart. So for restricting flow to the input of the heart, then we basically restrict flow to the output as well. So decreased cardiac output, which is related to decreased venous return to the right side of the heart. And then barotrauma. So in ARDS, our PEEP is usually 10 to 20. Normally it's around five, so you can see how much more pressure there is. That's why we use the decreased tidal volume because it de decreases the amount of barotrauma. OK, so a little bit more management for this. Uh, basically, we want to manage any of anxiety by giving them sedation, neuromuscular blocking agents, steroids, because we have a cytokine storm. Uh, we can do surfactant replacement, antibiotics, of course, uh, diuretics for the pulmonary edema, we really don't want to give them a lot of fluids because they're already lung soaked. So uh, fluids, the less the better. We need to concern ourselves with their nutrition uh, within 24 to 48 hours. And then, of course, um, any damage from the ventilator itself. So some of the complications that occur after ARDS, uh, again, decreased cardiac output, dysrhythmias, person could be delirious. Uh, PTSD, paralytic ileus, hypermetabolism, stress ulcers, DIC, blood clots. So do we know how to treat all those? I'm hoping at this point we do. And remember, for ARDS, the goal and for anybody in mechanical ventilation is to make sure we keep them on the least amount of oxygen possible so that we avoid oxygen toxicity. All right, and just a little bit more about permissive hypercapnia is that uh, our tidal volume being set lower decreases barotrauma.
We cannot use permissive hypercapnia with TBIs or increased intracranial pressure. And for this, our folks are pretty sick, so they do generally require IV analgesia and sedation. And then the last little thing, here's, uh, here's my fella. Uh, he's being proned here. So we found out with COVID that even as people were in early yards before they were on ventilators or anything like that, we used to have our patients prone themselves. So we'd have to go down the hall and, you know, say, lay on your belly. And um, every two hours we were proning. And again, we use proning because it allows us to oxygenate the patient better and use less PEEP. It's not an easy thing to do. Imagine trying to turn that patient with all of his equipment and making sure we're worried about the um, pressure points that we're creating. Uh, you could have a nerve injury from the way that they're laying. So it takes a lot of people, uh, usually, uh, usually several, in fact, including a respiratory therapist, make sure that the airway is always, always secured. And then once you have them prone, you have to make sure that uh, they're more in the sideline position so that the ventilator can do its job. All right, guys, so that is the end of respiratory part three, and we finished with ARD, so I will see you in class.